So most students in elementary school learn how to read musical notation. They learn the note heads and the lines of the staff and possibly even read some of it on recorders or other instruments. But what I find lacking in a lot of these discussions is why music notation is the way it is. If necessity is the mother of invention, what was the necessity that led to this innovation? And what did the great grandmothers of our current innovations look like? Well, strap in, I've got a lot of information to give you in only a few minutes to give it. Hi, welcome to the Listener's Guide. I'm Steve, and as we've discussed in previous episodes, a lot of Western music history has its roots in the medieval Catholic Church, and notation is no different. The earliest systems that we have of music notation are called neumes, and they were simply squiggles above religious texts that were designed to jog monks' memories while they were performing the Mass. Ah, They were codified, but as you can see, they don't really tell you anything unless you had already learned the chant orally. And this imprecision was a very big problem of the Catholic Church, who was interested in standardizing the Mass across the entire empire. Enter Guido of Arezzo, a music educator so important that he deserves his own video, but for our purposes today, all we need to discuss is that he developed a four-line staff with one or more of the lines labeled by letter so that the pitches could be accurately represented. And in fact, this system was so revolutionary that it's basically what we use today. You may notice, for instance, that this clef labeling the G and D lines looks curiously similar to the modern day treble clef. So this system spread quickly at the hands of the church. Now performers could read and perform music without having to have heard it first. But there was one major problem. Because it could only reflect pitch and wasn't very good at reflecting duration, it was only effective for notating chant music because chant music was the only music that was performed that way. By the 13th century, however, people had begun to adapt the symbology of Gregorian chant to reflect this sense of rhythm. Notes were essentially divided into long and short, and in fact those were the symbols' names except in Latin, long and breve. Now, because some notes are incredibly long and other notes are incredibly short, the system was expanded, but the idea remained pretty much the same. With this innovation of them, we see a massive outpouring of other kinds of music, especially of the secular variety. Now that people could accurately write down the music that they came up with, we also had a new kind of musician show up. A composer. People wanted to take credit for the music that they were creating. <laughs> Throughout the Renaissance and into the Baroque era, technology also continued to develop which had its own effect on notation. You may have noticed, for instance, that so far most of the notes we've seen have been very thick, very black notes, which are easy to write with a calligraphy pen on parchment, but become rather runny when applied to paper. And for this reason, we start to see a shift toward what we call white note notation, where the notes are mostly made up of outlines instead of being filled in. This was also advantageous after the development of the printing press because it allowed printers to save ink. The notes grew rounder over time and developed into the ones that you may be more familiar with today. We also see the addition of the bar line around the 16th and 17th centuries, which gave greater visual clarity to rhythm, which up until that point had been dictated by a somewhat more complicated system called mensur. We're not going to get into that system today, but my Second Balcony supporters on Patreon will get their own mini video about that as their reward video for this week. But this 17th century model seems to be where most music teachers stop, and I never really understood why. There are plenty of musical situations that cannot be notated with this format. Take for instance how Renaissance lute players were reading off of tablature because the staff didn't entirely suit their needs. 
or how incredibly dense piano music often incorporates a third staff to make the notes legible, or perhaps how Steve Reich had to invent his own kind of notation for his piano duet called Piano Phase to represent the fact that one of the players had to speed up slightly faster than the other one so that they were no longer in sync, or how John Cage wrote entire pieces that were conceived only as notation that the performer was to interpret however they saw fit. There are plenty of musical situations that demand their own kind of notation, and it's important to remember that when we discuss musical notation. It is and always has been an incredibly fluid practice that depends more on the desired performance than anything else. So what about you? What are some interesting notations that you've come across in your musical experiences? Or perhaps what's one musical activity that you've wanted to do and haven't necessarily had the notation to do it with? Please let me know in the comments. A special thank you to everybody who followed up on my video last week and supported me on Patreon. There's still time to do that, link in the description. Please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and I will see you all next time on The Listener's Guide.